Good evening and welcome to our evening service here at Silver City Baptist Church. Um, we are, as I mentioned this morning, we're going to have favorites tonight, so be prepared with those favorites. Uh, and uh, I do have one prayer request that came in this afternoon. Um, George Haskell, which is uh, Brother Baricell's daughter's boyfriend, uh, was riding a motorcycle and got into a motorcycle accident. Uh, he's at Tufts. Um, healthcare and um, brain activity and everything seems to be fine but he's got a lot of injuries so uh, he asked me if I'd pray for him tonight uh, when he had our prayer time and again continue to pray for Pastor Cooper uh, with his side effects and then Joshua of course with his breathing um, so let's begin with a word of prayer <clears throat> dearly father Lord I thank you for tonight and the opportunity we have to worship you Lord to gather together here uh, sing praises and uh, and then uh, open your word later on, Lord. And I just pray that you would be with these requests tonight. Uh, think of George and the injuries he sustained in this accident. I just pray that you uh, heal his body, Lord. Uh, just help him to be not in a lot of pain and to um, have a full recovery, Lord. And I just pray also for um, Pastor and his health uh, side effects from the treatment. I just pray you continue to help heal his body and uh, thank you for the good report of them not seeing any cancer but I just pray that you continue to help him as he goes through the rest of these treatments and pray for Josh as well with his breathing and just uh, help him to continue to recover from COVID. I pray for uh, others Lord that we've brought before you and um, Brother Kirk and Pam and uh, others that with physical ailments as well that they're going through just pray again that you'd uh, touch their bodies and help them uh, to have relief from some of the pain that they're in. Pray as, again, you'd help us uh, as we worship tonight, that we'd uh, be able to worship you and um, <clears throat> to apply the message to our hearts, Lord, and to our lives and as we go out from here and be testimonies for you. Just give us a good time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to sing favorites. And let's, does someone have a favorite? I guess we'll start with that. Yes, Henry. One forty seven? If I don't know it, you have to come up and lead it, you know that? <laughs> I said if I don't know it, you have to come up and lead it. <laughs> Why? I think I know this song. I'm looking for my wife's knowledge. <laughs> okay, I probably do. <laughs> Number one forty seven. Anyone else? 
Yes. 417. 417. It is well with my soul. Yes, Queenie. At the cross. At the cross. Do you know the number by any chance? Mm-hmm. All right, at the cross. One twenty nine. <clears throat> Like a river glorious, 402. Over all the 
right, we'll take a break here and go for our announcements, and we'll come back to more favorites. So keep thinking about your favorites. Um, Wednesday night, Pastor Cooper plans to be back with us. Uh, Lord willing, he'll be feeling better. He has been in the past couple of treatments, so, um, but we'll be able to worship in song, study God's word, and then have prayer requests and prayer time after that. Um, and tonight, of course, after church will be youth basketball, um, and uh, the kids will be able to, I'm not sure how many more weeks they'll be having that, but um, tonight they'll be having basketball out back. All right, I think that's it for announcements. Next favorite? Yes, can it? 461? 461. <clears throat> oh, to be like Leonard. 691. Saved by grace. Probably have time for one more favorite after this.
electrician. I think Vanessa won tonight. <laughs> 783? 783, Battle Hymn of the Republic. All right, I'll have you all stand since you've been relaxing there for all these songs. I forgot. <laughs> 783. <clears throat> Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his kingdom. seated. Uh, at this time, we uh, will have our message coming up, uh, but I just want to say this morning's message was a great challenge, um, really for any of us, uh, even if we're in the, the will of God, uh, that one mistake, that one mistake can change it. So I'm looking forward to what, um, I forgot your last name, <laughs> Brother Devin has for us. <laughs> um, as he comes and shares, please uh, open, your, open the word and follow along. <clears throat> Okay, very good. Thank you. Is there anything I need to do with this mic? Are we all set? We good? All right, very good. We're on. Very good. Uh, let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I had an excellent afternoon. Uh, this morning I said I'm always sharper in the evening. Um, what I didn't take into account was uh, the Silvas were going to force feed me this afternoon all this good food. And right now I feel very, ha very fat and very happy and uh, a little sluggish too. <laughs> so she, uh, she brought it, she had a full course meal there. We had uh, mashed potatoes and it was that, not sweet potatoes, but uh, butternut squash. We had uh, some carrots and some uh, roast beef and uh, I think that was roast beef. It was some sort of beef. Roast beef? Would you call that roast beef? That's good. It was delicious. And uh, then I was all full, and I had, I've been on a diet really all summer long. And I lost about uh, 35 pounds. Uh, if I came here and preached uh, back in May, you'd see a lot more of me. Uh, but now you're seeing a little less, and that's a good thing because I was getting pretty chunky. And uh, so I've been on this diet, and I'm like, I see all that food. I'm like, well, today's going to be a cheat day. Um, so I, I gorged myself on all that food, because if you're going to cheat, you might as well cheat all the way. So I had seconds on everything I could, and uh, I've been doing low carb, and I'll tell you, it's the first time I've tried that many carbs in a, well, since I, on Labor Day when I went to a fair and had a bunch of onion rings. That's the last time I had that many carbs. It was delicious, and I was stuffed, and then she goes, oh, I got hot apple crisp in the oven. I was like, well, we'll have to stuff a little more in there, and I enjoyed some apple crisp, and and then on my way out the door, I got a second helping of apple crisp, too, and it was delicious. So thank you so much for your hospitality. I appreciate it. Uh, my waistline probably won't appreciate it, but I appreciate it. So thank you very much. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It's going to be a topical message, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And uh, preaching on taking a stand, taking a stand. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and we'll be in verse 13. 
The Apostle Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. It was a book written to the church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth was a church that uh, was a good church. It was a church where a lot of people have been saved from some rough backgrounds. If you had testimony time at the church of Corinth before service, you would hear a lot of really fascinating testimonies. Perhaps maybe like a, uh, a Las Vegas of the Bible times. It was really a, a city like that. There was a lot of sin in the city. And people were on fire for God that got saved there, but many of them fell back into sin, and there was some rampant sin going on in the church. And Paul addressed that much throughout the book. He uh, kind of used the sandwich method. You know how you, you compliment something that's doing good, and he did in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And then he had a whole pile of stuff where it's like, hey, we need to straighten this out. And towards the end of the book, he says, hey, you guys can do it. Uh, get right with God. Start walking with God closer. Uh, so 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and then verse 13, we're reading about taking a stand. And uh, Paul was a man who was an excellent example of taking a stand. Uh, Nicodemus, uh, not Nicodemus, but uh, Joseph of Arimathea that we preached about this, or taught Sunday school on this morning, he was a man who took a stand. But we read about he served the Lord secretly for fear of the Jews. Uh, the Apostle Paul was not someone like that. He was... I'll tell you, when I think of boldness, I think of the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's amazing the, the amount of boldness that he had. And he was somebody who knew a little something about taking a stand for Christ. He had, he had lived that with his life. It's one thing when somebody says, hey, you should do this. And it's another thing when somebody says, hey, you should do this. And they, they back that statement up with their life testimony. And that's always challenging. And that's what the Apostle Paul's doing here. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, he says this, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you very much for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to preach to the congregation here. pray that you bless each one of them. and uh, You know the spiritual needs that are, are present here. I pray that you would meet those spiritual needs and uh, feed us with your word this evening. Pray that I would preach clearly and accurately and uh, be true to your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul says, stand fast in the faith. And that's a challenge that every single one of us has to face every single day. We have to stand fast in the faith. I'm thankful for men that I know who have stood fast. They've taken a stand. I think of my pastor, Jim Townsley. Uh, 1975, he left Indiana, and he went to Southington, Connecticut to plant Central Baptist Church. And they started actually in the Knights of Columbus Hall, and they moved to William Strong School and some other locations until finally after four years, they wound up by purchasing a factory building. And uh, in a great step of faith, they stepped out and they purchased that factory building. It was extremely expensive for the zero money that they had at the time. And uh, you can see how God's met Pastor Townsley's needs. You can see how he's uh, had to face some challenges. Uh, when we started New England Baptist College in 2004, uh, the state of Connecticut decided that they didn't want us to have a Bible college. Uh, they said we had to be accredited by the state. And we, because of conviction, we felt that that would uh, violate our convictions to get accredited by the state and to put ourselves under the state. And what does the state know about training preachers? They don't know anything. Um, so we didn't want to do that. We took a stand, and there was an ongoing court decision with, I believe, a $1,000 fine for every day that we were open as a Bible college. We went to court and fought it in court, and eventually there was no resolution. They just dropped it. Uh, they didn't really drop the case. It's just sitting in limbo in the court system, and it's still present in the court system today, but we're not going to poke the bear about it. You know, We'll just let it be. Um, that it, we, I see how Pastor Townsley took a stand in that fashion. Uh, also, with starting New England Baptist College, we got into a lot of debt. I believe it was like $3.3 million or somewhere around there, a lot of money for our church, and uh, it was a big step of faith to start the college, and we had financial problems very early on, and then we see uh, Pastor Townsley lost his voice for, uh, for 18 months. He was completely out of the pulpit, could not talk at all, just sometimes he couldn't even grunt. There was just nothing that came out. He got the diagnosed with a disease called spasmatic dysphonia, and it was incurable. And they said he'd never really speak again normally. Uh, but it took about three years, but the Lord 
all but cured him. He's, all, he's almost 100%. And every once in a while, he still struggles with it, but it's almost perfect. Uh, and you see how uh, God challenge, allows challenges to face us and, and puts us under testing and trials. And during those testing and trials, that's when we got to remember, hey, we need to take a stand. It wouldn't be so hard to take a stand as a Christian if you never faced trials, if you never faced conflict. Uh, but we have reasons to take a stand as a Christian in today's day and age. You have to take a stand at work. You have to take a stand amongst your family. You have to take a, a stand amongst your friends. You must take a stand uh, in the community around you. And as you watch the news, you notice Christians are in the minority. Uh, we really are, but we need Christians. We've never, uh, well, I'm sure they've said this at every generation, but I can't imagine there's been a time in our world where we more desperately needed Christians to take a stand. Uh, we need Christians that will commit to taking a stand. But it's, it's important that we take a stand, but it's even more important where we choose to stand. Uh, we have to know where we're going to stand. See, right now, there's, if you look on the news, there's people taking stands about everything. Uh, there's people taking stands about uh, women's rights. There's people taking stands about racism. And, and, you know, women should have rights, and racism was wrong, and uh, you can... Look and see people taking a stand on the liberal agenda, people taking a stand on the conservative agenda. There are stands all over the place that people are taking. It seems like in our culture, it's very popular to get very passionate about one specific thing. And in my generation, the millennials specifically, you'll notice that they get on the bandwagon quickly about some sort of cause. Hey, let's all put the you know, put this uh, little frame on our Facebook profile pic so everybody knows, you know, that I believe this way. And we jump on a cause, and then we jump on a cause, and we jump on a cause, and we jump on a cause. That's what we're seeing in our culture. But as a Christian, ooh, I don't think the sound system like that. Am I okay? All right, good. Uh, but as a Christian, uh, we're not called to just be bouncing around where we take a stand. We're supposed to figure out where we're going to take a stand, dig our heels in, and stay there. And I'm thankful for people who have done that. Your pastor, Pastor Cooper, has been in New England for a long time. And I, I don't really know him at all, but I've never been here before. Um, but he's had to take a stand, I'm sure. And if he was here, I'm sure he could talk about many, many times when he's had to take a stand. And you notice that stand hasn't changed. Uh, 20, however many years it's been since he planted the church here, uh, 20, 30 years later, he, this is still a gospel-preaching church. It's still a conservative church. It still believes in traditional music. It still believes in the Bible. See, that takes a stand to, to stay there. It's one thing to pick a cause to say, hey, I'm going to take a stand for this cause. It's another thing for 10, 20, 30 years down the road to still be standing in that spot. Paul, throughout Paul's epistles, he talks about specific places to take a stand. And uh, our first spot we're going to bounce to is actually just a page before in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to be in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. First Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Uh, first, we're supposed to stand in the gospel. Uh, that's where we take our position. The idea I have of standing is not uh, just simply getting up and standing and being seen by everybody, but it has the idea of holding your position. Uh, I am built like a football player. But I never played football in high school because my high school, I went to a Christian school. We didn't have a football team. Uh, but the only real rough contact sport that I played a lot of was a game that our sixth grade teacher, God bless his memory, uh, uh, taught us called British Bulldog. And it's also called American Eagle. I was really good at this game. Uh, I was the best, the undefeated champion at this game because I was the biggest kid in the class. And it was a very simple game, not my kind of game. There weren't many rules to it. Uh, you were on the soccer field, and you had to run from one end of the field to the other. That's it. You just had to make the stretch. And there was people out there called, called the Bulldogs, and their goal was to tackle you, 
lift you up off the ground and hold you up there for three seconds and then drop you. And if that happened to you, then you became a bulldog. Well, I was the heaviest kid in the class by a good 20, 30 pounds. I was built like a bulldozer. And uh, I cruised right across that field. I wasn't the fastest kid across that field, but I'll tell you, I bulldozed my way through a lot of them bulldogs. It was great. And there were times when, uh, I mean, they dogpile on me. Towards the end of the game, there's not many people running across the field. Most of the people are there, the bulldogs, they're trying to take you down. I remember one time, I had about five kids dogpile me. I mean, it was, it was like the highlight of my sixth grade life. It was awesome. About five kids dogpiled me, and I'm just crawling through there, kept pushing through. It was awesome. I was the hero of the game. I won that day. It was great. Uh, but that game, the object was to take a stand, to hold your ground. And there were times when people would try and take you down, but you just had to hold your ground. You couldn't let up. And as a Christian, we got to hold our ground in the gospel. Uh, that's what we're all about. Everything goes back to the gospel. Uh, other religions, you know, uh, mainline denominations sometimes, or the super spiritual, uh, you know, deeper Christian life kind of people, they'll, they'll, um, they'll, uh, they'll call out the Baptists on being shallow. All you ever do is talk about salvation. All you ever do is preach salvation. Well, salvation's pretty deep. I mean, it doesn't get any deeper than that. Christ dying for your sins, there's something like 35 or so different things that happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin. Uh, theologically, there's all these different things that happen. We have a home in heaven. Uh, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have the sealing of the Holy Spirit. We now have direct access to the Father in prayer, and you can go on and on and on about all the things that happen on salvation. But we don't ever want to get past our salvation. Uh, some of the godliest, most spiritual people I ever know are people who have been saved for 30, 40, 50 years, and they can't get over their salvation, how God saved them. Uh, and every single one of us, I hope every single one of us here, we have a salvation testimony, but that's someplace where we want to take a stand. We want our life to be about getting out of the gospel. We don't want to water it down. Uh, our, our, our Christianity is not some watered-down gospel. No, it's about sin, and it's about Christ forgiving us of our sin. And that's someplace where we don't want to waver. We want to take a stand in salvation. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Paul had preached the gospel in Corinth, and now some time later, I, I'm not quite sure how long later, but it was some time later, maybe two, three years, that he's writing this epistle. He says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. He just keeps repeating the same message over and over and over again. I've got uh, some unsaved family now, and uh, when my parents first got saved, we had a lot of unsaved family. Everybody was either Roman Catholic in our family or atheist, and it was a challenge to stand in the gospel. It really was. Uh, the gospel caused some serious division amongst our family. I remember when I was 10 years old, I got baptized, saved when I was 6, and baptized when I was 10. Baptism, it doesn't help save you. Uh, it's not about saving at all. It's something you do after you're saved as a step of obedience. And when you get baptized, you're identifying yourself publicly with Christ. Uh, it's our first command, what we're supposed to do after we get saved. So it took a few years. I was a slow learner, but I got baptized. And I remember my Roman Catholic grandmother came to that baptismal service and it was one thing for us to go to the Baptist church. She was a little annoyed about it. But it was another thing to get baptized into the Baptist church. And I remember her bawling her eyes out in the pew as me and my dad got baptized. That day, I believe it was a, uh, the Sunday right after Christmas. Our baptismal, the water was heated. But the air in the baptistry, there was no heat back there. It was, don't ever get baptized in an unheated baptistry in December. Worst decision ever. Get, do it sooner. Do, do it during the summer months. But I remember getting baptized, and that caused division in our family. I remember a lot of awkward family get-togethers because you've got the Roman Catholics, you've got the atheists, and they got this mindset that um, you can be on drugs, you can have trouble with alcohol, your family can be a mess, but you become a Baptist, that's the last straw. Now you've done it. Uh, that's the mentality they have, and it caused some serious division. 
But later on, it took a while, but my cousin got saved. He got saved actually at the very first Youth Fest that our church ever hosted. We got Youth Fest coming up in a few weeks. Well, he got saved at the very first one. My Roman Catholic grandmother that bawled her eyes out when I was 10 years old, when I got saved, uh, I was able to lead her to Christ when I was 16 years old. Uh, my other grandmother got led to Christ uh, through a family in our church just going door-to-door soul winning. Just, you know, you witness to the people for your whole life. Then somebody random knocks on their door and leads them to Christ. It's just, I don't get it. But that's how God works. Um, it, it's wonderful. And that's, all that fruit came from taking a stand in the gospel. If our family backed down, if we just, well, we're not going to mention it. You know, we'll go to church, but we'll be quiet about it. That would have never happened. I wouldn't have saved family members right now. It's important that we take a stand in the gospel. Also, it's important that we stand in the faith. And our text verse mentions that, but I want to turn over just a couple pages to the right to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be in verse verse 22. So now we're fast forwarding some time. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, and I believe there was a book after 1 Corinthians that wasn't inspired. It's not uh, something that's been preserved in God's word, so it must not have been God's word for us. Uh, but not, And don't get caught up on that. There's all these, every seems like every year they come out with a new book that was just found in the Bible. You know, the book of Judas or the book of you know, whatever. There's all these different books out there uh, that people come up with in the Bible. If God wanted us to have it, he would have preserved it for mankind. Don't get hung up on that. You can watch, we're talking about the History Channel this morning. I was talking with a few folks. Don't get hung up on when the History Channel talks about these new books that come out. No, it's, 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 we're not missing out on some truth. God's got the truth that he wants us to have right here in the 66 books of the Bible. And there's all kinds of proofs and and things of why we have our canon of scripture. Uh, that's, we don't have this canon of scripture by accident. It wasn't just some random books that were picked. No, these are proven. Uh, so, 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul wrote this book to the Corinthian church, and they did great. They listened to Paul, they got a lot of things right, and they were walking with the Lord. And the book of 2 Corinthians was written at the end of Paul's life. Now, this is after he's faced prison. Now he's He's awaiting his, I believe he's awaiting his trial, and he's probably going to get executed. So he's near the end of his life. I believe it's the second to the last book that he wrote, uh, 2 Corinthians, and we're going to be in chapter 1, verse 22. Paul says, Who hath sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts? Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I come not as yet unto Corinth, Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of of your joy, for by faith ye stand. The church was facing a lot of persecution at this time, and it said, for by faith ye stand. Now we talked about standing in the gospel, but if we're going to continue standing in the gospel, we got to do it by faith. Uh, You can't stand in the gospel through willpower. Uh, There's nobody with a personality enough that's determined enough just to stand where God's put him. No, it has to be done by faith. We get saved by faith, but then we hold our ground against Satan also by faith. Uh, then we grow in the Christian life also by faith. And, and that faith that takes, the faith it takes for salvation, we have to exercise faith all throughout the Christian life. And the Christian life is just one step of faith after another. Uh, from faith to faith, the Bible talks about how we grow and We get faced with conflict and we have the faith to get through that. Then we're faced with more conflict and we have the faith to get through that. And we grow and then we have more faith and we grow some more. And it's a slow process and it's an arduous process and it takes time. Uh, You don't wake up one day and all of a sudden you're a super Christian. No, it takes time to grow that faith. Well, Paul says, for by faith you stand. Uh, And every single thing that we do in the Christian life is done by faith. Uh, When we go out and witness, it's done by faith. When I'm witnessing to somebody, a family member or a friend, I have to have faith that God can save that soul. Uh, I have to exercise faith to do that. When you come to church, that takes faith. You know, why would you be here on a Sunday night? You just listen to me on Sunday morning, now you're back on Sunday night. Why would you do that? Why? Because you have faith that God could have 
has something in his word for you to hear today. Uh, why do I have faith to go be faithful in different ministries? It takes faith to be faithful. Uh, why do you have faith to trust the Lord with your finances, to tithe, and then to give to missions? Why do you have faith to read God's word every day? Why? Because we believe that God has something for us, and God is alive and well, and he's there to help us grow in the Christian life. Uh, we have to stand in faith. But then also, Paul says in a different book, uh, Romans chapter 5, we'll turn there. Romans chapter 5. Different book. This was written by the Apostle Paul to Rome. And we'll be in verses 1 and 2. Romans 5, 1 and 2. I guess the preaching was that bad. Uh, Romans 5, 1 and 2. Uh, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith. So we're saved by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Paul says we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. God's got a lot of grace. Uh, grace is getting something that you don't deserve or bestowing something uh, to somebody that they don't deserve. Um, I was talking to Sammy today just before service and uh, you know, if Sammy decided he was just going to kick me in the shin, uh, that, would, that would hurt. You know, I'd, he's not a real big guy, but I'm sure he could inflict some pain. You know, it would be mercy for me not to punch him back. Uh, that would be mercy. But if I took out a candy bar and I said, here, Sammy, I'm not happy you kicked me in the shin, but hey, here's a candy bar on me. That would be grace. Me giving something to him that he didn't deserve. He didn't deserve that. He didn't work for it. I had to work for it. I had to obtain that candy bar and then just give it to him free of charge when he didn't deserve it. That's grace. And God does that to us every single day that we open our eyes. Uh, God is a gracious God, and I'm thankful for that grace. Uh, how many of you guys can say, well, let's not do a show of hands, but think about it. How many of us have messed up just this week in the Christian life? We've said something we shouldn't have said. We've done something we shouldn't have done. We stuck our foot in our mouth. Maybe we had some wrong thoughts. Maybe we're struggling with a besetting sin. You know, God could just take us right off this earth. But no, he's gracious and he's long-suffering and he loves us and he cares for us and he's willing to work for us. And even when we mess up, he's still there to say, hey, I forgive you. Let's help you get back up and get back on the Christian life. God is a gracious God. And we have all this grace upon us. And then it's our opportunity to bestow that grace on other people. Uh, and we, if you're in church long enough, you're going to get offended by somebody. Uh, maybe the pastor. Uh, you'll get offended by the pastor probably at some point. You'll get offended by the person sitting next to you in the pew at some point. But every single Christian, we have to exercise grace. Uh, if we're not exercising grace with people, what does that say about our relationship with Christ? Uh, when Christ exercised so much grace with us, now it's our choice to stand in that grace. To say, hey, spiritually, when I mess up, I can go right back to God because we're standing in grace. We're in a position of grace. And then as we work with other people, we stand in that same grace that God's bestowed upon us, and we extend that grace to other people. I think of my pastor, Pastor Townsley. There's been so many times when he's been wronged, ripped off, People have done something mean. People have hurt him. Uh, people have posted wrong, bad things about him that were untrue. But you see that he chooses to stand in that grace. And that's an excellent testimony. I'm sure your pastor is the same way. I don't know your pastor, though. But it takes grace for a pastor to pastor a church. It takes a man who's determined to stand in grace. And as a Christian, we've had so much grace bestowed upon us we need to choose to extend that same grace to other people. Uh, we get so many things that we don't deserve, and we need to choose to, to give other people things that they don't deserve as well. Uh, number four, we're also to stand in liberty. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. While you're turning to Galatians chapter 5, uh, another place I forgot to mention, uh, we get grace for when we go through trials. 
Uh, the Christian life, it's something that can't be lived by willpower alone. And uh, Paul talks about his uh, thorn in the flesh. We, were, we didn't mention that verse, but Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh. And he talks about how he asked the Lord to take away this thorn in the flesh from him. A lot of people believe it was his eyesight, uh, but we don't know because it's not mentioned. We're just surmising that it's his eyesight. Uh, it talks about in the Bible how he struggled with his eyesight. Uh, but that may or may not have been his thorn in the flesh. I saw a, um, a comic one time, and uh, it's a comic of the Apostle Paul writing uh, where he talks about that thorn in the flesh, that Satan sent a thorn in the flesh to buffet him. And there's a picture of SpongeBob right next to the Apostle Paul. Uh, you guys know who SpongeBob is, the kid, children's cartoon character. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, Paul talks about grace. And uh, we get grace from God to bear the trials that God's placed upon us. Uh, so Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We're also, as a Christian, to stand in liberty. Uh, before we were saved, we were slaves to sin. Uh, but after we're saved, we're set free. No more, no more does sin have dominion over us. No more does, does Satan control us. Now we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And the Bible says in 1 John uh, 4, uh, oh, I'm going to butcher that. 1 John, never mind, I won't mention the verse. But uh, it says, um, man, it's all that apple crisp. It's, it's killing my brain cells here. <laughs> uh, wow. All right, well, I'll just skip that. Uh, but we're supposed to stand in liberty. It'll come back to me, I promise, just once the apple crisp is digested. Uh, we're to stand fast in liberty. Uh, Christ has made us free. Uh, we're no longer, oh, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, it talks about overcoming the wicked one and overcoming that spirit of antichrist in the world. Uh, we're called as a Christian to be an overcomer. And we're able to overcome the world we're able to overcome the devil, to overcome the flesh by the power of the Spirit, uh, by standing in that liberty. No longer are we entangled with that yoke of bondage. Uh, one time, I, I was a little kid, and we had these uh, sticky mouse traps. I was probably like seven or eight years old. And we would put a little glob of peanut butter right in that middle of that sticky mouse trap. And uh, we, we had a mouse problem at the time, and uh, trying to get rid of them. And we had that sticky mousetrap set up in a corner of the kitchen because there was a mouse that we heard running in the wall. Well, I went out probably about 20 minutes after we set that trap up. I walked out of my room and I heard a noise and it was a noise of a mouse that got his paw stuck in that sticky mousetrap. And he was trying to shake it off. You know, this little mouse is trying to get away from this mousetrap that's twice the size of himself. So I'm a little kid. I just stood there and watched it. And I'm watching this mouse, and he's got his paw stuck in it, and then he got his other paw stuck in it, and he's even more stuck in it. And then he managed to get his hind legs. I'm just watching the show, you know, as a little seven, eight-year-old. He got his hind legs on the back of that mousetrap, and he actually was able to pry his legs out of the mousetrap. And he got away from the trap, the sticky trap, and he's looking at the peanut butter right in the middle of the trap. And he circles right around the track, and then he de decides he's going to make a lunge for it. And he dove for the peanut butter in the middle of the trap, and he just got all stuck. And he was done at that time. But sometimes, as a Christian, we live like that. Christ sets us free from that yoke of bondage. Sin no longer has dominion over us. No, we're no longer entangled about in sin. Uh, we have the power from Christ to overcome that sin. And we get away from it, and we're doing good. And then we look back at it and we go right back to it. Paul said, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Uh, we're to choose to be in liberty. We have the power to do it. We have the ability from God to do, stand in liberty. But we have a sin nature we're fighting against. We have a devil we're fighting against. We have the world we're fighting against. And all that works to try and get us back entangled again in that yoke of bondage. Remember the Israelites... When they left uh, Egypt, they were wandering through the desert. They, the Lord uh, made all those plagues happen to set them free from Egypt. They walked through the Red Sea. That was a picture of baptism. 
Uh, now they're in the wilderness, and right away they've seen God do all those things, and then they said, we've got no food to eat, no water, let's go back to Egypt. And over and over and over again, for 40 years, uh, they were just battling, Moses was just battling to keep the Israelites from going back to Egypt. Every time a challenge would come, they'd want to go right back to Egypt. And as a Christian, we may, it's not easy to live the Christian life. It takes faith to live the Christian life. It takes grace from God to live the Christian life. But so often we face some conflict and we just want to look back right from where we came from and go right back to it. Paul said we need to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Uh, we're to hold our ground there. When Satan tries to tempt us to get away from that liberty, to enslave us again, we fend him off and we resist the devil and then he flees from us. Paul talked about a lot of places where we're supposed to stand. We're supposed to stand in the gospel. We're supposed to stand in faith. We're supposed to stand in grace. And we're supposed to stand in liberty. And as a Christian, it's not easy to do any one of those things. Uh, but it takes a daily choice, a daily choice to, to live uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit throughout the day. And the Lord will enable us to stand in all those positions. Uh, it's important that we take a stand, but it's even more important where we're standing. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer and we'll, we'll have an invitation and then close in prayer. I have every head bowed, every eye closed. If the Lord spoke into your heart, I encourage you to uh, spend some time alone with him and talk with him a little bit about uh, what he's doing in your life and how he's speaking to you. Uh, perhaps there's a Christian here who'd say, you know, I haven't done a good job standing in the gospel. I've kind of backed off on, on leading other people to Christ and sharing, sharing the plan of salvation. Uh, maybe some of us, we're struggling with grace and we, we look at all the grace that God's bestowed upon us, but we struggle and we we, look, we have a hard time being gracious with other people around us. Or maybe living by faith is something that's so difficult for each one of us. Uh, standing in that liberty wherewith Christ has made us, made us free, it's, it's a challenge to do that. And so often we're tempted to go back and get enslaved with what Christ has set us free from. And however the Lord's spoken to you, I'd encourage you to uh, spend some time with him today. We'll have the instrumentalist play and uh, then we'll, we'll close. Lord, I thank you very much for where you've given us places to stand. I pray that you would help each one of us to take a stand where you've called us to stand. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for your attentiveness and it's good to see you all again tonight.